what I want to do is um, kind of, you know, maybe not once and for all, but to make sure that this is out there and that you guys have this information available. Because I believe that this is the largest obstacle to learning Budo. Um, and it is the obstacle of not understanding what a practice is. Why I need to train as a practice. Um, why my culture, my space time has geared me to not have a practice, a sense of practice, or even begin to comprehend why I need it, the point of it, and why I am slanted more towards, as a person living in today's world, to prioritize an intellectual an intellectualizing process over a practice, or to mistake an intellectualizing process as a practice. Um, I think that is where most of your questions are coming from, and why in past generations they were not only not answered, they weren't asked. So questions of how do I be, become committed to this? How do I gain discipline? Uh, how do I become brave? How do I gain any of the virtues that we discuss and try to cultivate through Budo? All of those questions come up from prioritizing an intellectualizing of the art over an actual practice of the art. So in Zen, for example, they'll talk about, oh, do you want to know the secret of Zen, right? Eat your rice, wash your bowls. Why isn't it upheld like it is today when you get in these Zen circles where these people will just have lectures, sermons obviously borrowed from other traditions that themselves had already adopted a prioritization of an intellectualizing process, had already had a long history of displacing practice with discourse or ideas. How do I ask when the answer is, just eat your rice and wash your bowls? Oh, how do I get brave? What? Just eat your rice and wash your bowls. How do I get commitment? Are you kidding me? Did you eat your rice? Okay, go wash your bowls. See, there's really no room for that discussion, right? It's so out of place. So it begs the question, why is it so in place for us? to ask those questions. And why do we believe that in asking them, we're training? And in having them answered, and understanding the answer, that we're progressing? Do you see that there's a total gap? There's a total paradigm shift in how we have come to understand what is self-cultivation? So through history, I'm not going to say that our paradigm, our prioritization of ideas, has not existed. I'm not even going to say that at certain points it wasn't the dominant paradigm. But what's changed is that that paradigm of practice has all but disappeared. There are very few people today who will commit to a practice that goes, oh, what did you do there? Well, I ate some rice, and then I washed those bowls. You're kidding me. What else did you do? 
No, that was it. What did the teacher tell you? Nothing. How popular is that going to be? What's that website going to look like? What's that yellow page ad going to look like? Do you just put a bowl there? Do you even bother to put rice in it? Who, who is going to be attracted? Do you understand how we just have zero attraction to that mode, that manner of self-cultivation? We are so unattracted to it that we dismiss it outright. If I say today, what did you do there? I just ate rice and then I washed my bowl. The person listening is going to go, you are crazy. Why waste your time? You could eat your rice and wash your bowls at home, not realizing that's the secret. They might respond back, well, at my lecture, I really gained an insight into how my mother didn't love me and why I can't be brave in situations that stress me out. Wow, that's something. Screw this rice-eating, bowl-washing thing. I'm going to go there because I think my mom didn't love me too. So there was always a paradigm of prioritizing ideas. When I was doing my doctorate work, I came across a scholar who pointed out that while the Greeks were famous for know thyself, the paradigm of know thyself, they had another one, which is take care of thyself. That is very similar to what we try to do in Buddha. We raise the question of wellness. We conjoin wellness with martial proficiency, with actually rating your skill in Budo. In other words, if you can throw Ikkyo, but you're unwell, we will say you don't know Ikkyo. Do you see that? You go, yeah, but I did it really hard and I broke my Uke's arm. Yeah, but you're still way below what you could have done. You still don't know Ikkyo. You still have not reached your highest expression of Ikkyo. It's just slowly over history, for very suspicious reasons, suspect reasons, not admirable reasons, the know thyself has come in and kind of taken over. It had a lot to do with class shifting, industrialization, the development of economic systems. Cut to the chase, pass through Descartes, where I, where I think, therefore I am. Jump to today, and you're trying to sell a system that is what? Eat your rice, wash your bowls. Who is going to pay for that? Throw in there the development of the psychiatric field of knowledge. Yeah, they've got really really, they're cycling in their moods between this anxious state and this depressive state. Oh, what they need to do is eat their rice and wash their bowls. Are you kidding me? We can all make more money and hang out with Descartes if we start this pharmaceutical industry 
and this notion where if we understand what happened, we can sort of fix it. And what we can't understand, we can sort of hide under a state of intoxication. And bam, you were born. And worse for you, you were born in Santa Barbara, or you live in Santa Barbara, where we're all idea people. And so you come to Budo trying to figure it out, trying to think your way through it, trying to go from one intellectual realization to the other one. Like you are in some form of Freudian psychotherapy. If you would only understand this about you, you would be able to do this. then what do I do with the fact that, for example, I cannot eat any because I hesitate. Part of my mind is afraid to enter on the inside of this sword cut or the inside of this right hook. And as a result, my body is entering in a segmented fashion. Maybe my head leans back. Maybe I don't enter fully. I leave the rear foot out of the technique. Or maybe I'm on the other side of the fear coin and I'm just, whoa, get in there. Just get it over with. So I over penetrate. I don't have the right mind. And I, I can realize that. I can see it. We can video record it and we can point to, do you see, this is where your rear shoulders, your rear shoulder was leaning out of the technique. Your head, you had a compromisation in your spine. Or look, you left your foot, you didn't enter enough. Or look, you're really, we can see you holding your breath, your shoulders are up high like this. You look very scared and upset in your face. Please, there's no way you're going to find my. And then you go, I know why I'm doing it. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of getting hit by that sword. I'm afraid of getting punched in the face. Or even, I'm afraid of the throw that's going to come when I enter fully. So that's why I'm leaving stuff out or over committing. So now you know I'm afraid. You know what you're afraid of. The strike, the pain, the uh, evolutionary fear of falling. You know it. We can write an essay about it. We can do whatever you want, whatever this culture tells you, you should do about it. We'll have a group meeting about it. We'll all share moments of our past where we think that was our first event of having that fear ingrained in our subconscious. We'll even do some pseudo practices. I'll go behind you and I'll have you fall backwards into my arms to see if you could do it. So let's say you totally understand all of that. You participate in all of that intellectualizing and I come in full blast with that strike again. Are you going to be able to do the technique? Yes or no? No. no. That's a huge clue. This is not that. That is not this. In many, many, many ways, the biggest mistake you can do in Budo in Aikido is understand it. I know that sounds odd. It sounds odd because you are a person of these times. 
and enough centuries and enough aspects of culture and of society have convinced us understanding must precede practice. And we sort of overlook the fact that I understand my fear. I know why it's there, and I still can't do it. We just go, well, that's, that's an anomaly. Society is telling me, oh, but you can do that same experiment with everyone, right? We've all seen that same experiment over and over and over again. Just in the IQ2 when you saw me pushing Ronin down. You might even look at that process and go, oh, Sensei is getting him to understand why he can't do it. I'm not. I'm physically engaging him and causing him to physically engage. Not in an intellectual philosophy, you know, philosophy of understanding the relationship between the fettered mind and the segmented or disconnected body. But just by shoving him. Just shove him, shove him, shove him, shove him. Now imagine the same way you go to a place of self-cultivation and you come back and your friend goes, what'd you do there? They shoved me. Did you at least eat rice? No, they just shoved me. How many times? The whole time. I got shoved for an hour. What'd you do? Oh, I sat in the theater and the Dalai Lama told me about it. Which one is more, do we think is more attractive? Do we think is getting us further in ourself, right? We are, we are people of that time. So we come to this wanting to understand it. We come to our Aikido, to our Buddha, wanting to understand it. And we have the belief that understanding should be prioritized over doing, over being. And that is why the worst thing you can do is understand the idea. Because you've taken the paradigm to which Buddha actually belongs to, subverted it, and replaced it with this one, our culture's paradigm. A paradigm that does not work. A paradigm that is not what we do. That's why I say the worst thing you can do is understand Aikido. What you are supposed to do is be Aikido. So again, you look in traditions where they had that notion of take care of thyself. And they prioritize that over the notion of know thyself. You're going to find examples constantly of where the person of being is held over the person of understanding. Constantly. You'll have the cook who's upheld over the guy who remembers all the sutras. You'll have the old woman who's just doing her laundry in the river who knows more than the abbot in the purple robe who knows all the sutras. All the religious texts can cite them all. But the woman doesn't know one of them. Or you'll have just full on ways of holding up and developing the notion of a founder. 
So you have Bodhidharma and the Chinese emperor will ask him, uh, I have uh, copied all the sutras. I have built all these temples. How much merit have I gained? How much have I reduced my karmic burden and my attachment to this material world? And the answer that Bodhidharma gives him, none. These are not just cute stories. These are evidence of a paradigm shift that we need to be very aware of. We need to understand our predisposition to intellectualize and to not develop a practice. We need to first understand, wow, my first thing is I got to actually learn how to practice because what I think is practice is just more thinking. So let's go back to these traditions and let's go back to history. The dojo, the word dojo is derived from Buddhist history. The dojo is a place, a place where you practice the way. When you practiced in the dojo, you did not have a domination of discourse, lecture. You had a prioritization of their core practice meditation whatever the school whatever form it was that's what you did and it was conjoined with other practices work begging cleaning farming there was no effort to try to go you know what planting carrots is very much like raising children. And then you draw all kinds of analogies and use all kinds of metaphors. No, what did you do? I just grew carrots. I just dug the earth and I watered the earth. That's really wholesome sounding. That's a weird thing to say. I just dug the earth, watered the earth. And then what did you do? Then I went back to that meditation hall and I, I just sat there and did my meditation. That's cool because you were outside and you went inside. That's like the whole system of self-penetration. No, I did not do that. I farmed and then I meditated. There's no analogies. There's no metaphors. It doesn't stand for something else. It doesn't even lead to something else. So when you joined in that system, you had to do several things. Again, you're going to see they're all practices. You had to be accepted. You had to demonstrate certain behaviors, certain conditions in you that would lead whoever was on the inside to believe you got a shot at this. Once you got a shot, an open door, you had to do things like shave your head. Shave, you didn't shave your head and you go, wow, that's really aerodynamic, you know, and now it's so much better because you don't have to worry about combing your hair in the morning. Always trying to make more out of it. Shaving your head was just part of you walking through the door because you walking through the door, the key to that was that door is closing behind you and you're not getting out. 
So hairstyles are a part of what's outside. Hairstyles are a part of culture. Same with your name. We're going to get rid of your name. You weren't allowed to bring what was outside inside. So, in that same light, you weren't allowed to bring a paradigm of know thyself into a paradigm of take care of thyself. So we have to do the same thing. We don't make you shave your head. We don't change your name. But we do say, you have to learn to let go of Mary. You have to learn to let go of Margaret. You have to learn to let go of Will. It's the same thing. If I could, I'd shave your head and change your name. But we're in a world, right, where we don't see the value of eat your rice, wash your bowl. What'd you do today, Will? No, actually, don't call me Will anymore, and I just shaved my head. Oh, man. I got the autograph of this Zen Abbot. How much merit does that give you? What did Bodhidharma say? None. None. <clears throat> So I would like you to understand the challenges before you, at least that, and I know I'm just using the word understand, but it's kind of like, just do this one last bit of understanding, and then don't do it anymore. Just practice. Just show up. Use the ideal of daily training to give you a direction. To problematize at the level of practice your strength or lack thereof. Your sleep discipline or lack thereof. Your flexibility or lack thereof your aerobic capacity or lack thereof, your right perspective or lack thereof. Perspective in this sense is, are you in tune with the truth of impermanence? But even with that right perspective, I develop it through those other practices. Now, we're human beings and we have a mind. We're going to use it. We're going to think. That's not the thing. We're not trying to be like, uh, you know, the anti-Vulcan character on Star Trek kind of thing. We just are not prioritizing it. In fact, as I said before, if you have only intellectual understanding, no practical understanding, we will say you don't understand. So even in Zen, for example, if you go, well, I have clearly understood shunyata, and you can't sit in Zazen past 10 minutes, then you have not understood it. Do you got that? You will have people who will do that. I've seen a documentary where a renowned book writer, spiritual teacher of today, can't sit still in his high luxury room that they afforded him at this traditional temple. And he says, ah, my awareness of the truth of the universe is deeper than theirs. 
it's, it's not just ludicrous, but you're again looking at a different paradigm. That's what we're interested in. So we are going to use our mind, but we're not going to prioritize it. In the same way that I mentioned in terms of your diet, get your macros in the ballpark, figure out what your macros need to be so that you can, in a healthy way, up your calorie count, up your carb count, without triggering any of the metabolic syndromes, any other kind of health conditions, right? Find out where your ceiling is. Then when you do that, then you can do the supplements and you'll actually feel them working. They'll work for you. And equally I said, if you don't get your macros in that level, these supplements don't do what you think they're going to do. Don't waste your money. Don't waste your time. Put your effort in this other direction. Same way, if you develop a practice, a true valid practice, then you use your intellect well, as a supplement. It will help you. It will develop your practice further. But if you don't have the practice and you're trying to use the supplement of the intellect, it's not going to do what you think it's going to do. It's going to do the work, the opposite. It's like wasting your money. Supplements are expensive, right? You're wasting things. You're going to have to work more to be able to afford that supplement, for example. It's going to come from somewhere. Same with this. You're going to lose practice somewhere by prioritizing your intellect. So we need to use it as a supplement. You will use it. But your problem, the the person walking through the door, their problem isn't, how do I use my intellect? That's not your problem. Your problem is, how do I develop a practice so that my intellect can be a supplement? So we say, hey, stop. Stop, just show up. Do what it takes to show up. Be present. Do what it takes to be present. And I think if you just let me go, hey, let's take that small environment and let's see if I'm going to emphasize, emphasize action, practice, doing in my training. And I will only look at the amount of time that I'm actually doing, acting, being. Exclude all the amount of time I read or think about, intellectualize about Buddha. You're going to see you don't train all that much. Right? <clears throat> it's like an hour, two hours, three hours maybe. Especially if I haven't learned how to bring my sleep discipline and my nutrition into this training. If I'm still floating around with my own cultural attachments and my own belief that I can actually develop myself as a warrior without my body becoming a weapon. It's kind of silly when you say it like that, isn't it? But if you look at the doing, being, acting time, it's really not that much. And if you compare it to the guy of old who walked in a door that shut behind him, shaved his head, changed his name, and you look at how much doing, being, acting time he's doing per day, we look like hobbyists. We want that perspective. Because how much of our not doing are we hiding in the belief that by thinking about it, we're doing it? Quite a bit. Quite a, quite a lot of us is going unobserved. So, what's my advice to you? 
develop a practice. At the simplest level, at the beginning level, that means you're looking at action, doing, being. As you get a more sophisticated practice, you're going to find out is, what's a false line my teacher drew between thinking and doing, between thought and action. But at the beginning, go ahead and work with me. Go ahead and go, I'll use that line. He already told me it was false, but I'm going to use it anyways. Right? Just like we teach the beginning back break fall. In a realistically thrown technique, you will never do that back break fall, right? But it allows the beginner to get in there and get some exposure to learn more things, including the importance of letting go of that version of the back break fall, right? So in the same way, it's a new paya, a skillful means that the teacher uses, taking note of your level of investment and understanding to get you to another level of investment and another level of understanding. Okay? So at the beginning, just pay attention to your actions. And in the same way, pay attention to your non-actions. What am I not doing? Do you understand that? Because the further that we stray from that, the more of that upaya we're going to have to use. The more I'm going to have to trick you, right, into doing this. That moves you further and further away from the purity of the teaching every time. So for example, take the last class, right? And some people were stuck on the uh, triangle get up from the back break fall versus this center development drill of how we were getting up this time, right? And I had to take the time and go, this is what you've been doing. This is what we're doing now. Don't do what we've been doing, okay? That is an upaya to address a person whose mind was stuck. Now take two practitioners. The one who can unstick their own mind and do the practice of seeing and doing and the one who needs to now be addressed at an intellectual level, have it all spelled out for them so that they can finally do it. Are those, the two, are those two people the same quality of deshi? No. Are they at the same level of practice? No. How do we know that? Well, let's up the stress. Let's shove them and see what was happening when we shoved them. They could not get up the, that way. Why? Because they, the way it was, had to be taught to them, it had to come in through their intellect. And when the stress is high enough, you can't tap into your intellect. So we lost the technique. So the upaya sounds great, and you might actually go, what a compassionate teacher. He really showed them. But in the overall truth of things, I actually did them a disservice. What, what the teacher does then, it goes, okay, I'm going to disserve you here to get you in the ballpark, I know I screwed you over and I'll catch you over here. That's why commitment is so important. A lot of times it's all, eh, I jacked you over here, I'll pick it up this year or that year. But every time you have to veer away from the pure practice, every time you have to employ an upaya, you have a degeneration of the practice. Every time. So again, you go back to Buddhist history, and there was an idea in Japanese mappo. There's an idea that culture and society would degenerate, would be filled with so many people who could not understand what was actually being practiced that it would require so much upaya on the, uh, coming from the teacher 
that the teaching itself would now become impotent and enlightenment was now no longer possible. <clears throat> That's the problem before us. Many, many people will say, we are in Mokbo now. Many said we got into it hundreds of years ago. <clears throat> So, I'm not going to debate whether we're in Mapu or not, but I understand the mechanics, and that's what I want you to understand. You must develop a practice, you must understand the more upaya you're receiving, the more impotent the practice is becoming. So you can help yourself out a lot by adopting the practice, not the understanding, of moving from know thyself paradigm to take care of thyself paradigm. When you take that paradigm of take care of thyself and you look at all the things that we talk about, all the things we, all the information we disseminate, it's all doing. And if you look at your own training, where you actually have an advancement in your practice, let's take it a mundane thing. I can now throw you without killing you, or not throw you. If you go, wow, I'm getting thrown harder and I actually feel safer. You had to do all those other practices we've been disseminating up to that point. You can look at contrast. You can look at the people we cannot throw hard and see, yeah, they're not in body conditioning or they're not doing the diet or they're, right? They still believe that they sleep, they do better with five hours of sleep a day. So do yourself a favor and understand your condition. And then choose wisely. And then that's it for choosing. Any questions or comments? There's an element, Speak loud. It seems like there's an element of trust you have to have that it just doesn't. Uh, can't think about it, you just have to do it and trust that it's going to eventually work. Eventually yes, catch yeah. up, eventually. <laughs> there, is a, there is a huge element of trust. And again, you know, we have enough cautionary tales. And think about it. Anytime you have a societal paradigm, they're going to come with their own fables. It's going to come with its own mythology. It's not just going to be a matter of institutions you know, that are put in place. It's going to have its own, look what happened to so-and-so. Oh, you know, look at Jim Jones and you're a Kool-Aid drinker now, right? Um, we, the whole idea of cults, you know, this is, this is our paradigm reinforcing itself, you see? Telling you that if you try to do something without understanding, you're setting yourself up. So you, you, it's not going to be that our paradigm is know thyself. It's going to be uh, you should know thyself because it's take care of thyself. One, it can't happen without knowing yourself. And you'd be a fool to not know yourself. You're really putting yourself at risk if you just go in there and start doing. It's always going to be like that. That's one of the reasons why we have that free month of training. It's only a month. 
it, it, I present it as a free month. <clears throat> it's not that in practice. In practice, I don't want to commit to people who cannot commit. Or even more, I don't want to commit to people who cannot learn commitment. So the flaky looky loos, they look through and they go, ooh, free training. It's like a piece of cheese for the rat. You understand that? The ideal student will come in and go, I don't need a trial period. Make the teacher go, well, I need one because I don't know you at all. Well, that's fine. I understand that. But I would like to be up front and, and say, I have come here to commit to the training. It's a trick. Let me see if you're a good modern consumer. So if you are, if you're the perfect modern consumer, the perfect rat, then we don't have you. It works like that in all kinds of ways. But let's say you're that ideal student. You come in and you just say, I am committed to it. If you need to run me through a trial period, please do so. But I am committed. That takes a lot of trust. But if you look deeper, it's not really trust in the teacher. It's trust in you. So I've told you before, I have had many teachers. Most of them were far from being the Buddha. I still practiced commitment because it still works as a practice. I mention that because that means I can go from somebody who I might know as abusive and still gain the benefits of a practice, still gain the self-cultivation that comes with utilizing the practice of commitment on one end to something like we have here. And once you understand, wow, there's a lot of room in between those two, maybe I'm not such an idiot for trying to take care of thyself paradigm. And you can look, and you can look at people, and you can see, and you, you will gain your experiences yourself. Wow, that worked. Ooh, this is working. Ooh, that thinking thing didn't work, right? We teach from both sides. And that helps you gain the trust and the commitment. But again, every time you need that extra thing, you have utilized Upaya and you've taken away from the potency of the teaching. So you know, and I did the uh, my bachelor's, my master's, and my doctorate work in the study of religion. And I will tell you, I have never come across a text <coughs> where I read of the novice going to the temple and interviewing the abbot. <coughs> right? Never once. Clearly we're in a different time. As I said, be aware of it. Be aware of it. We do, Upaya. We address where you're at. 
but we can't get away from the mathematical consideration that we have degenerated the potency of the teaching. Maybe that's what those Buddhists from a long time ago got a sense of, where they developed the concept of mapo. And go, oh yeah, yeah. There's a, actually, you know what? That guy did one, he did a kind of interview. Oh, this youth of today, I think it's just going to get worse for me. I can imagine several hundred years from now, we just won't be able to teach anybody anything because they don't have the trust for it. They don't have the commitment for it. They don't have the capacity for faith to do it. And so they are always going to try to understand and the irony is that they're going to try to understand from a position of ignorance. They're going to try to understand what I'm saying in French when they don't speak French. They're going to try to understand coqu when all they know is muscling. They're going to try to understand Aiki when all they know is retreating, disengagement, pajama softness. They're going to try to understand relaxation when all they know is uh, unconsciousness. How do I go from this level of ignorance to this achievement? Certainly, only through commitment, only through trust, only through faith. Not by intellectually grasping and then trying to find it. I don't have the context. This is one of the reasons why. I mean, think of it as a kind of math problem. Woo! I need the context to understand and... I don't have the context. Is there another way I could get this? Yeah, let's practice. Any other questions?